felt the Holy Spirit, just the, the overwhelming joy of the presence of the Lord this morning has been strong, and it's been so good to worship in the presence of God. I want to talk to you for just a, a few moments this morning about what God's doing in our church, what He's doing, going to do through our church. We get to share the love of Jesus Christ. That's pretty good. We get to share the love of Christ locally. I am so proud of a team that ministers from, from Atlanta all through North Georgia. Uh, we, have the, we have one of our largest outreaches ahead of us here in just a few months in, uh, in North Georgia that we've ever had. God's helped us reach people, and I'm thankful for a local team. Amen? I'm also thankful for a team that goes globally, and we have a young group of young people about to go on missions. We have uh, 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 several opportunities for you to go on missions. I actually am going to be preaching in Africa in September. I'd love for some of you to go with me. It'd be a great trip for you, uh, uh, but you need to know you're saved before you go to Africa. Straight up, don't come if you're playing games with God. That's not the trip for you. But uh, we're going to go and be ministering there in Ghana. God's going to be doing some amazing things. When I say missions, a lot of times it's hard to get involved because it seems so far away and costs so much. But in the last couple of years, the Lord has allowed us to engage the city of Atlanta in missions projects. Last year, we had over 200 churches get involved in our missions. That's pretty unbelievable. I was excited. 100 of those churches, before we made an opportunity for them to participate in missions, didn't have a missions program, and now they have a missions program. Isn't that exciting? Amen. Amen. God's doing some great things. Well, it's that time of year where we release, uh, as a lot of you have known this was coming, our, our missions opportunity for the year for, the, for all of us to get involved. And it's a very simple, simple project, and I'm very excited about what God's going to do. You know, we've done the bikes. We've done, we, last year we had 148,000. How many remember the 148,000 shoes in the gym? This one little church collected some, and they were like, man, we were worried about the bugs and things that brought in our church. I said, you think you had a few shoes in your church? You should have seen my church. Amen. Uh, 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 Semi-truck loads of shoes in here. And God did some great things through that. And we were able to send forth, and we're still trying to raise the rest of the funds to complete that project, but we we're well on our way. And God's doing some good things. But this year, I wasn't even looking for the project when it found me. That's usually the way it is. When God grabbed hold of my heart, how many of you have seen those really sad commercials where they say for $1.33 you can feed a child? Yeah. And so for only $30 a month. Well, that's what we're used to hearing. And I know that built into a lot of those is usually a tremendous amount of expenditure for uh, uh, the, the officials and the, the, the corporate execs and the advertising, that commercial price and, and all. And so when these people stood up and they said, would you like to help me feed a child? And I was there to learn for our missions. I wasn't there to help feed a child, to be honest with you. And they said, uh, five cents. Five cents feeds a starving child. I had the look on my face some of you have on yours right now. What? I quickly did the math, and for $18.88, a child's life can be saved for a year. And look, we've already taken our offering today. You don't have to feel threatened. This is not about you writing a check, but if you would like to pay $50,000 to feed a million people, we'd love for you to write a check but we're still going to do the project because that means we'll feed two million. When I came out of the meeting, I said, well, we're going to feed 1,000 people, 365,000 meals. That, you know, 365,000 meals, that's pretty... I got into the meeting to make the commitment. Our staff were sitting around me, and instead, the Holy Spirit prompted my heart. And Before I even realized what I said, I looked at the people and I said, will you help me feed a million? And they said, yes, we will. I'm looking at you now. Will you help me feed a million? Will you help me feed a million? I'm not asking for your money. That's the beauty of this. I don't want your money. I want for you to engage in this project with what you have. And what you have, we collected the bikes out of your yard and cleaned out space in your garages. Last year we got the shoes and one man said, I want you to know my wife gave almost every shoe she has, but we've replaced them all now. Amen. It's a good idea, ladies. Amen. But this year, what we're asking for is for you to do as many of these as you can, and you can be any kind of bag. It doesn't have to be this kind of bag. But to take any excess clothing you have, whether it be a purse, a hat, a belt, a shoe, whether it be, I don't care what it is. How many of you have excess clothing around your house? Be honest. You know what? And fill a bag with the extra. 
this is the way I, this is the kind of clothes I have in my house. I have the clothes that I'm wearing. I have the clothes that I hope I never wear again. And I have the clothes that I've dreamed of getting into. Come on, amen. Well, I'm going to get honest and get rid of some of the others. Amen. But as we get rid of that, you know, one bag, one bag of your old clothes. I feel the Holy Spirit. I'm going to preach to you in a moment. I, like I said, I have preached so excited all morning that I'm, I'm afraid I won't have enough voice for this service. But what I'm saying to you about now is I'm preaching the word of God, whether you realize it or not, because Jesus said, when you do it unto the least of these, you do it unto him. We're going to feed some hungry kids in northern Kenya. We're going to feed them the best meal they're going to have. Anybody around is going to have. They're going to have that meal every day. Matter of fact, we're going to feed not an orphanage. We're going to feed orphanages. And we're going to feed AIDS colonies and share the love of Jesus Christ with them so that they can find hope in the middle of their death sentence. Because God's with us. Now look, this one bag filled with old whatever clothing, purses, hats, belts, whatever, shoes, underwear, I don't care what it is, old, clean, dirty, I don't care because I'm not opening the bags. We're selling those to a wholesaler. The money's going to buy the food. But this one bag feeds 55 people. 55 people. <laughs> My daughter, off her floor, should be able to take care of a whole village. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Amen. 55 people. Maybe she's going to kill me later. Amen. 55 people. Hey, how many of you like the show American Pickers? Anybody like the show American Pickers? That's one of my favorite shows. So this week on spring break, we got away for a few days, and we went there. And it was really exciting. I'm lined up to go in, and I can't afford any of the antiques. Uh, you know, that's like he pays a lot for them, but he sells them for a lot more. And uh, but so what everybody there is doing is they're buying the T-shirts. Now, the T-shirts were $34, $34 for the T-shirt. $34. Yeah, that's what I said. Yeah, what? $34. bucks. 34 dollars I found a T-shirt, but I got it off the clearance rack, like half price or almost or whatever, you know, significantly less. And, and I said, well, I can do that. And that went to, you know, Mike and Frank's pocket. Well, I have a T-shirt. I don't need to sell you this T-shirt. We have churches begging for these, but I said, no, I got these for Warhill. This Warhill's not making a dime, not a dime off of these. In fact, this project's going to cost our church thousands of dollars, but God's going to move for us. If you buy a t-shirt for 20 bucks, they're right through that door right after service, 20 bucks, this church doesn't get a dime, but 400 people that weren't going to eat, eat. 400 people. I want my whole family to have one of these blue t-shirts. Why? Because I want to know that we're taking what God has given us and we're doing our best with it. How many will agree with me we can feed a million? Yeah. Amen. Amen. Let's bow our heads. We're going to pray over the word. Then we're going to go to Romans 8. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the Holy Spirit. Thank you for the joy of the Lord that is our strength. And I ask you, God, that you're going to open this message to us, but also open this project to us. Father, and as you, you had even just, just spoken to me about the part that you gave to me clearly that I have not shared, I will share faithfully. But Lord, I ask you from this project, this word, where we are today, do your will in our lives. Father, open our eyes that we might see who you want us to be, and we can catch a glimpse of Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. The Holy Spirit quickened me while I was praying. The one thing I forgot to tell you is I really believe, and these bags, they're going to have them for you right after service. The shirts are available. But I really believe that somebody here, God's got a call on your life. And I believe that this project is going to be one for leaders to be revealed from. There are people here who say, I'll fill a bag, and I thank you for filling a bag. But there are people here who say, I'm going, to, I'm going to organize my community to fill a bag. I'm going to organize my job to fill bags. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to change as many lives. What if you said, why don't you make a challenge? What if some of you say, you'll feed 1,000? Some maybe you try to feed 10,000. What if you made that determination? You were going to make a radical difference. And I really believe through this time, there are going to be leaders emerging in this church. I feel that in my spirit. I felt quickened to come back to this. Leaders are going to emerge. In Jesus' name. All right, I want to bring you a message today called Look Me in the Eyes. If you would, first thing, would you help me for just a second? I want you to look at someone near you. I want you to look them right in the eyes and say, I'm glad you're here. Would you do that? Don't say it unless you look them in the eyes. Look them right in the eyes and say, I'm glad you're here. Some of us, stop kissing. I didn't say kiss. <laughs> My goodness. In the earlier service, some of our senior citizens were like, I'm going to go home looking at each other's eyes. I said, don't tell me, don't tell me, don't tell me. Amen. All right. All right. Look me in the eyes. 
Romans chapter 8, verse number 35. What a powerful question. I, I feel like so many times when I come into the service, I preach a message that's like a shotgun. It's going to hit everybody. But today I felt like God is specifically after some of you. I believe that some of you are in this place. Some have already heard in the other services, but some are in this place right now. God has sent this message for you. Romans chapter 8, verse number 35. Paul asked a very powerful question that many of us ask. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? One young lady in the earlier service heard uh, this message and said that's the verse that she quoted before she went uh, under anesthesia for surgery this week. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Then he asked another question. Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or are hungry or are destitute or in danger or threatened with death? I think when I come to talk to you today about this very topic, can anything separate us from the love of God? I think that most people here understand that, that God loves us. Amen? Amen? I think as much as most of us understand that God loves us, there are probably a majority of us who have at some point or another connected to the love of God in our lives. But not only have we connected to the love of God at one point or another in our lives, we also probably know what it feels like to feel unconnected from the love of God. You see, we struggle with an inability to connect. We don't really know how to, how to connect with people around us. The generation that we're living in really struggles with the ability to connect. I'll walk into a local restaurant, you'll see four or five, uh, uh, 15 uh, to 30 year olds even. They'll be always sitting around the table. Every one of them will have their phone out texting each other. I thought all you have to do is lay that down and speak. But there's a problem with connectivity. Even in people's homes, I didn't say this in any of the other services, but I feel this. You feel lost, you feel, you feel uh, uh, alone, even sitting on the same couch with someone. And if you're going to communicate with each other, you're going to text each other. You argue via text. Those things happen via text because the connectability is lost. There's a, there's a problem with connectability. And if we have trouble connecting with the people we can see, how much more do we, not have, do we have trouble connecting to a God that we can't see? We don't know how to connect with people. Well, let me just try to, I'm going to try to identify that today, and then I'm going to try to help you learn how to connect with God. But the way that we begin to connect with people, connection begins by eye contact. Get that. Connection begins when you make eye contact. Powerful, powerful tool. As I began to study this, this week I was studying how that, that uh, we don't really make eye contact with people. It is estimated by scientists that only 30 to 60% of the time you're communicating with someone are you actually looking them in the eye. And I began to try that. I began to think about it as our family sat together and the way we were communicating, the way people were communicating even here this morning. I've watched it. I, I've studied that, that a lot of times we're not really looking at each other. We're, we're, we, you look, they said that a lot of times we look at their nose, we look at their mouth. We most often watch their, their mouth. We're listening. We're, we're focused in there. But we rarely look into someone's eyes. We rarely take time to make that connection. Uh, in 1989, they did a study that concluded that, that, that when you bring two people together uh, and they look each other directly in the eye, it is one of the greatest, if not the greatest, point of connection for all of humanity. When they brought two complete strangers together and allowed them to stare into each other's eyes for, for two minutes, they felt a compassion, they felt a connection that, that was deep, almost lifelong. When you brought two strangers of the opposite sex together and allowed them to stare into each other's eyes for up to three minutes, they would often describe a feeling of passion and deep love that they could not understand because they didn't even know this person. But there was a power in what they were seeing. There was a power in looking into the depth of who the other person was. There, there was a power in seeing beyond the superficial and, and seeing them. And most of us spend a whole lot of time putting up walls, putting up, but putting up things that keep people out because we don't want people to really see who we are. We don't want them to see our pain. We don't want them to see our struggles. We're afraid if they see our questions, they'll think we're not spiritual somehow. And we put up all of these walls, and these walls keep people away from us. They keep people out because we don't want anybody to really see who we are. But when you learn to look at someone, and you see them, connection is made. When you're in love, words aren't necessary. You get lost in each other's eyes. Can I get an amen? amen? That moment when you have seen each other so deeply that there is no turning back. The connection is made. That moment is called the point 
of no return. The point of no return. Now, if I was talking to you in the concept of space and, 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 and things that happen in space, uh, this moment is mirrored when the gravitational pull becomes so great that it is impossible to escape. The most obvious example of this is the black hole. And a black hole is a celestial object so massive that light can only enter, but it never exits its gravitational field. The escape velocity of the black hole is greater than the speed of light. Since light enters at the speed of light, light can never exceed speed of light. It is impossible for light to ever escape from the black hole because once it has entered, it has it. There's a grasp. There's a hole on that, uh, on that light. It will never come out again. Why? Because once it's crossed its horizon, there is no turning back. It is my great joy today to preach to you about the love of God. To preach to you about a God who, once you lifted your eyes to Calvary, once you looked on the love of God, once you embraced the grace of Jesus Christ, you passed a point of no return. You crossed over into a horizon that no matter how great your struggles and no matter how deep your problems, when God uh, uh, met you and you fell in love with God and God's love was experienced by you, you passed the point of no return. When you confess Christ, your horizon changed and God's love will chase you. Let me just be clear about this. God's love will chase you every moment of your life. Why? Because God is love. That's the kind of God I've come to preach to you today. I've come to declare to you that my God is love. He's not some terrible uh, being that you have to fear, even though he is worthy of fear because of his reverence and his holiness. But he is a father who was, I, I made the mistake earlier in one of the services of saying, he's dying to show you his love. And I said, no, 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 he died to show you his love because God loves you. That's who he is. And he wants you to know how much he loves you. When you realize that God is love, you'll know that nothing pulls stronger or longer than God's love. Once you have tasted of God's love, you have passed into the place of no return. God's love is freely given, but so many struggle to experience God's love because they have the messed up concepts of what love is. Many think, love leaves me. Many think, love uses me. And some think, love spoils me. But to understand who God is, you have to fully embrace His love. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 17, describes this a lot better than I can. Ephesians 3, 17 says this, Then Christ will make His home in your heart, watch this, present here, as, as you trust in Him. Not when you trusted in Him, but Jesus is wanting to come into your life in a greater way as you trust in him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. That when you cross over into the depth of who God is, when you begin to trust Christ, when you begin to walk Christ, the scripture says that as you open different areas of your life to him, that you are going to begin to grow and you're going to begin to know God's love in a greater way. As a matter of fact, he said even this way, and may you have the power then to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, how, and how deep his love is. And may you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to understand fully. Then you will be made complete. Listen to this, with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. You see, some of us, we've been trying to do better. We've been trying to earn God's love. We've been trying to figure out why God doesn't love us. And the word very plainly says, stop trying to earn God's love and start trusting God. And as you trust God in the love that he's showing you, you're going to realize that when you open up your heart to God, you don't get hurt. When you tear down the walls and you allow God to see who you really are, you will come out better than you went in. And I feel the Holy Spirit today. I'm getting to preach to you about the power of God, the love of God, the strength of God. How many of you know that God's all-powerful? Can I get an amen? We talk about a God who the Word says the earth is His footstool. We talk about a God who the Word says that, that with, with, with His mouth He created all that He is. I love the, the song they sang on Easter that said that He breathed out galaxies. That's the kind of God that I serve. 
I don't serve some little God that's wrapped up in some little statue somewhere that somebody has to dust off. You don't have to dust my God off. My God created dust. Don't you understand that? My God moves and the universe would move with him. My God is all powerful. But just as powerful as he is, he is love. And his love is measureless. There is no end to his love. But Pastor Don, you don't understand. I think I've reached it. You're wrong. You have not even began to understand the depth and the width and the height of God's love. You cannot outrun his love. But Pastor Don, I've tried for so many years. You're just getting started beginning to experience the love of God. See, his love is measureless. That's the other thing you've got to realize, that his love is unconditional. That's a really plain word. Unconditional. But what about, no, no, no. Uncondition. But what about, no, no. Unconditional. Amen. It's simple. He loved us while we were still in our sin. His love is unconditional. If he loved you while you're still in your sin, why do you think he doesn't love you because of your sin? Maybe I just need to preach for a moment. Amen. You see, his love is unconditional. You can't earn it. You can't earn more of it. You see, we realize we can't earn it, but we think we can earn more of it because I can be a better Christian. I can be a better... No, 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 no. His love is unconditional. He loves you. Well, maybe when I'm a mature Christian, God will love me more. No, no. He loves you. Maybe when I beat this area of my life. No, he loves you right where you are. His love is unconditional. His love is measureless. He loves you just the way you are. But I don't know how to love him back. That's the beauty of it. If you don't know how to love him back, that only reveals how great his love really is and how unconditional it is because in the imperfection of your inability to love him, the perfection of his ability to love you is revealed even more that he doesn't even mind if you're not reciprocating because he still loves you because it's unconditional. I've come to preach to you a God who did not come to stamp you out, but a God who came to build you up, restore you, seek you out, and give you hope because God loves you. I feel this this morning. And here in Romans chapter 8, Paul is wrapping this up. I, I thought maybe we'd finish this week or, or next week. We may have a week or so more, but we're finishing this long study in Romans chapter 8. And as we're coming to this conclusion of this, what Paul's doing here is it's really brilliant. He, he's gone into almost uh, his, his, his legal mind. He, he was trained and a member of the Sanhedrin, so he's acting as a lawyer at this moment. And as he goes into that, he's asking a question that he already knows the answer to because the answer will expose the truth. And so he asks this question. He says... Can anything separate you from God's love? Then he follows it up with another question. He says, but what if you're going through really, really bad things? And he starts listing bad things. And as he's listing bad things, he says, what if it seems like your world's turned upside down and everything's falling apart? Do you still know God loves you? But here's what he lists. I want you to get this. The bad things he lists are the things he personally had been through. When he talks about calamity, don't you think he was holding on once again to a ship that was about to sink? When he was talking about uh, uh, what was happening uh, 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 around him, and he's talking about all the pains and the struggles, don't you think he could be back to where he was stoned and left for dead? He says, can anything separate you from the love of God? When, when he's uh, 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 standing before the ruler of the known world who's sensing him and judging him, and he's sitting there saying, can even that separate you from the love of God? He says, what if you're even in danger of death? Maybe he reached back and he felt the 195 scars on his back from the whip that he had received, and he says, is there anything that can separate you from the love of God? And he says something so powerful here, what he's saying is, no, nothing can separate you. I've been to death's door. I've been in the, uh, the fire I've been in the struggles I, I've even fought the beasts at Ephesus he said I've been in all the problems that you could imagine and the only thing I can tell you for sure is even in the middle of my storms God's love was still there as a matter of fact I felt it even stronger because in my inability his grace showed up and his love was present Paul says I tell you you can experience nothing that will separate you from God's love you see it's during the darkest days that you look in the eye of the storm and the love of God comes shining through. 
Not love that runs, but love that lasts. Hardship has one of two effects on love. It either hardens our heart or it softens our heart. It will either soften our love or harden our love. You see, hard times can bond marriages like none other. Hard times can cause men to become bands of brothers. The kind of love God wants to reveal to you is not pretty love, but love that is bound by blood, sweat, and tears. The kind of love that is tempered by 50 years of marriage. The kind of love that has endured a miscarriage, the death of a parent, or even an affair. The kind of love that has been knocked down, but has gotten back up. Love that is unshakable. And God began to reveal something to me as I was studying for this message that has spoken to me so true this week, that has radiated in, in the very fiber of who I am. God, if, if, if looking into the eyes of one lets me know who they are and causes me to, to fall deeper and deeper into relationship with Him, God, I want to know how to look into your eyes. God, if I want to connect with you, how do I connect with you? And that's where God began to lead me in this message with, with looking at how do you look into the eyes of God? Are you ready for this? Worship is when you look God in the eye. You cannot worship unless you're willing to look him in the eye. My goodness, I feel the Holy Spirit. See, sin and struggles and problems, what do they make you do? They make you get downcast. They make you hold, hold on for dear life. And you always end up in a position something like this. You always end up in a position something like this. But you cannot. What is the enemy trying to do? Get your eyes off of God. He's trying to get your eyes off the mark of which there is hope. He's trying to get your eyes off the one who's screaming, I love you in spite of your storms. But worship is when we have to. I cannot worship looking down at my problem. I cannot worship looking down at my failures I cannot worship looking down at my inadequacies and what I cannot fix but in order to worship I have to look up unto one that is higher than I in order to worship I have to lift my eyes up unto one who is my hope my strength my ever-present help in my hour of trouble I will lift my eyes unto the hill from which cometh my help I will look up for my redemption draweth nigh there is a God who is able and faithful and I look unto him amen you see, when we gather to worship, we are not just singing the words of poets, but something down inside of us is crying out. It hit me like a bowl of lightning standing here earlier. When you're facing sin and you don't know what to do, what do we do? We run and we hide and we get down and we go, help me, help me, help me, help me. What would happen different instead of looking at the sin and looking at our own failures if we were to plant our feet and begin to declare, you're greater than this sin. You're more, you're more precious than what I'm desiring of the world. I have tasted of the Lord and he is good and I will not succumb to the temptation that's after me, man. Pastor Don, why are you yelling? Because I'm talking about my favorite topic. I'm talking about getting in the presence of God and knowing, knowing he's in the room. Amen. I'm tired of people feeling like church is something that has to be wrapped up and pretty and neat. Church needs to show up and mess up your environment so you know that the devil's not the only one who can move in your life. God's here. God wants to touch you. God wants to change your life. When the people in the study in the beginning looked at each other, they said for the first 30 seconds it was awkward. I mean, just, just go stare at some random stranger. Awkward. It's hard enough to make eye contact with people you love, right? It's awkward. But what happens after a moment? Sorry, you're in the, the hot zone. <laughs> what happens after a moment? You don't only see just that awkwardness they said after about 30 seconds something changed they said that you started seeing he can't let me now come on amen <laughs> that you started seeing the color the little wrinkle the tiredness you started seeing their story after just a moment it was just a glimpse of their story. The Bible says the eyes are the lamp or the light of the soul. They reveal what's inside of you. 
that for just a moment you felt like you knew them. Am I making sense to anybody? You felt like you knew them. Why? Because if you were looking in my eyes, you're going to see the wrinkles. You're going to see a little scar from where I, I was dropped as a baby. <laughs> you're going to see part of my story. And I feel the Holy Spirit when I'm about to say to you, but when I lift my eyes in worship and I lift my voice, He sees my wrinkles. He sees my scars. He knows my history, but He takes me just the way I am. And He says, listen to what He says. He says, I love Revelation 21. He says, and they shall be my people. And I will be their God. God says, when we begin to connect, I feel the Holy Spirit. Come on, come on, guys, quickly. When we begin to, get, begin to connect, somebody come play. When we begin to connect and the presence of God begins to show up, we realize He knows us. And yet, He loves us. I want you to just think this through and then we're going to pray. But, but pastor, if what I'm experiencing right now is happening in my life because God loves me, then what kind of love is this? Your world is turned upside down. You're facing a storm. You don't know if your marriage is going to make it. You don't, you don't know if you're going to survive. You don't know if your job's... I mean, whatever it is, and you're going, how can God love me if I'm here? Well, let me ask you, in the Bible... Was God's greatest example when he opened the blind eyes? Was that his greatest example of love? Was his greatest love revealed when he broke the bread and, and fed them? Was his greatest love revealed when he touched the leper and his skin became new? Or was his greatest love revealed on an old rugged cross? You see, love that lasts breaks through in the darkness love that lasts love that will keep you is found not in the good moment but in the dark moment I don't know I haven't said this in any other services but somebody listen to me you, you, you dating somebody think about marrying somebody that runs in your dark time you need to run from them You need somebody that can wipe your brow when you got a virus. Come on now, man. You need somebody that, that doesn't care what is judged against you. They're going to stand beside you. You need somebody that mirrors the love we found. Even in the hard times. God sent me with a message. He loves you. And he wants you to look him in the eye. So you might know. You don't understand how strange this is. I'm trying to conclude, but I feel the Holy Spirit. I preach in a world today that people, billions of people all over the world preach a God that says, die for me. I preach to you a God who died for you. Who says, lift up your eyes unto God. I, see, I preach this in all these services, but some, God's doing something right here, right now. What are you going to see when you look in his eyes? Imagine what Peter felt. Peter has just denied the Lord. Stand with me if you would. Peter has just denied the Lord three times. He's cursed. As he, he thinks it can't get worse, he looks before he runs, he looks sees him. He sees Jesus. Jesus doesn't look at him in disgust, but the Bible says Jesus looks at him. He sees him. He sees his faults and his failures, but he loved him. He loved him. That's the kind of God that wants to look at you today. I don't care how many years you've been bound I'm going to have to say what I feel the Holy Spirit today. I don't care how many years you've been bound by a bottle. You need to look up out of that bottle because God's come to deliver you. I don't care what sin, how many nights of darkness you've spent looking at things you shouldn't look at. You need to look to God. There's hope. 
I don't care how great the scales of despair are upon your eyes, as they did for Paul, they will fall when you get a revelation of who God is. You need to look into his eyes. Would you bow your heads with me for just a moment? I know I've been excited this morning, and I am not ashamed. I have had the distinct honor of preaching the love of God. I get to speak truth to a generation that is hearing the lie of the devil. That God doesn't love you anymore. That God couldn't love you because of your sin. That, God, that God's love is not able to be shown in your life. And I declare that is a lie. That is a lie. That is, I don't care where you've been. I don't care what you've done. I don't care what you've injected. I don't care what you've smoked. I don't care who you've cheated on. I don't care what you've done. God still loves you. And he wants to forgive you. I don't care if you're a hypocrite and you've tried to live right in front of everybody else, but the darkness of your soul haunts you. God loves you. God loves us all. God loves you. Every head bowed and every eye closed. I told you today that this message has been very targeted. Not a shotgun message, but very targeted. But if you're here today and you say, Pastor, I know God wanted me to hear this. I needed to hear this today. Can I see your hand if that's you? Hands all over this place. You can put those down. Maybe you're here and you say, I know exactly what the area is of my life is where I'm having trouble experiencing God's love I know exactly what that is and I want to confess that to God and I want to invite him to come into that area and change my life if that's you can I see your hand right where you are yeah thank you just like these have raised their hand there are people here today and this is the first time the Holy Spirit led me to ask this in all these services there are worshipers who have not looked into his eyes like they should have lately. And you want to confess that. And you want to make a commitment to search out your Heavenly Father like never before. Can I see your hands if that's you? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Put those down. I didn't embarrass any of these. But now I want to ask one last group, and I'm not going to embarrass you either. If you're here and you say, Pastor, I don't really know God's love because I've never surrendered my heart to Jesus Christ. Maybe you prayed a prayer, but you know that's so far away from where you are right now. And you want to know Jesus. You want to know Christ. If that's you, with everybody praying, nobody looking around, this is your moment. The Bible says if you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe that God raised him from the dead, your life would be changed for all eternity. And if that's you today and you want to surrender your life completely to Christ, can I see your hand right where you are? Just hold it up high. This is your day to give your life to Jesus. Thank you, sir. Is there another? Today. Thank you, sir. Is there another? Who would join with these two men today and say, this day I will give my life completely to Christ. This day I want to surrender and know Jesus with all my heart and my soul. I want you to join hands with someone near you if you would. If no one's near you, you don't have to step out from where you are. But We're going to pray a prayer of faith. Somebody prayed it with us, then I'm going to pray for all these others that have raised their hands. We're going to pray a prayer of faith with these men today who've said, today's the day I'm giving my life to Jesus. The Bible says that we confess Him with our mouth and believe in our heart that we would be born again. Let's make that prayer of confession now. Pray with me. Jesus, by faith, I believe your promise. Now, I confess I am a sinner and I need a Savior. I believe you died for me. I believe you are alive. And in Jesus' name, I receive God's grace and forgiveness. In Jesus' name, I declare... God is my Father. Heaven is my home. Jesus is my Savior. Father, I pray for these that have prayed this prayer for the first time today. Lord, I pray that you're going to settle this in their hearts and in their lives. Father, let them know you with all that they are. 
Let them know you from the, the, just the very fabric of their being. God, I ask you, by grace and by your spirit, that you, living God, I declare that again, you, living God, will show your favor upon their lives. Father, now, in Jesus' name, for these who have said their areas of their life that they need to surrender to you in. Father, open your love to them. As they open their eyes to you in hope and faith, God, open your love to them like never before. Allow them to see you in your grace and your goodness. Church, would you join me now? Would you lift your hands in this place? Father, we declare there is none like our God. You are our rock, our fortress, our ever-present help in our day of trouble. There is nowhere we can go that you cannot rescue us. There is no bondage too deep, no struggle too rough, no attack too forceful that the hand of God cannot deliver. For nothing, nothing shall separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Come on, give God some praise in Jesus' name.